and play no weakness of the soul take every virtue morning. Please open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I have some visitors with us today. We're glad that you're here. I ask that you consider come, come back. If you're in town for a while, come back again tonight or on Wednesday night at 7. But certainly next Sunday if you're around, and join us as we worship God together. Glad to see some Faces I haven't seen in a while, some visitors with us. I'd like to talk to you this morning about a passage in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, in just a moment. Although there are times that we live pleasantly, especially here and now, no one gets all the way to the end of life without facing the cutting edges, the rough patches of life. Whether the storms of life are focused directly on us or they're focused on people that we love, storms come. Jesus said that. The storms of life happen. And there are real scenarios in life when it's hard to keep the temptation of and the, the consequences of heartache from tumbling into pits of despair, whether it's against us or against people that we love. There are hard times, whether it's pain, anguish, job loss. I mean, there's an ellipsis of human problems that can affect us in awful ways. The folks to whom this letter was written were facing just such occurrences. They were being attacked with the loss of their livelihood. They were practically being robbed and nothing was being done or could have been done about it. And it was a great temptation to revert back into old ways, old ways that they had left. But the Hebrew writer tells them that the gospel of Jesus meets their suffering, meets their longings in a way that nothing else could. The gospel of Christ is a message of hope. And in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, the Hebrew writer said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Find grace to help in time of need. The gospel of Christ is a message of hope. It's a message of hope because it's a message that helps. This isn't just, this isn't just some sort of ethereal philosophical thing that helps us with our minds about the sins that we have committed. It does that, but it, it, is, it is so much more than that. It helps us live. Because one of the problems with life is when you hit rough patches, when you hit rough edges, when you hit roadblocks, or when it seems like the roadblock hit you, you want to quit. I mean, that's what our adversary wanted Paul to do all throughout the study today. He, he wants Christians to quit. 
And our Lord says live. So what are we going to choose? What are we going to choose when we find trouble all around? What are we going to choose when even dealing with our own failings in the past, we look at ourselves as useless, as worthless, as not good in any way, shape, form, or fashion? What are we going to do? Well, the Hebrew writer says, we've got Jesus. Now, one of the things that can happen, especially since we talk about Jesus all the time, is that this, is, this can become, nah, 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 talk about Jesus. Brothers and sisters, friends, there is a transparency and a realness to the Bible that we don't get if we treat Jesus like a religion. The reality that we have given to us and the perspective through the gospel deals with reality in ways that doesn't just wish things away. Because what we know from the scriptures is the damage that sin has done. Not only was mankind separated from God because of sin, but it's, it's the effects of sin has so pervaded this world that God created us to live in, that it seems, depending on the scenario, it seems like hardship and heartache are just around every corner. We've lived away from family. Cindy and I have lived away from family long enough that there were spells that any time that we got a phone call from Tennessee or Kentucky, we're like, oh great, what's happened now? And, I, and I've never wanted to... If you know me at all, you know that I'm not one, I don't want to be Eeyore. If you don't know about a hundred acre wood, Eeyore was always, oh great, Christopher. You know, I, and I, I don't want to be Tigger, but I trend more toward Tigger than I do Eeyore. You can't be bouncy and flouncy in the, with this body. But Eeyore happens. But to the problems, there are real things that happen in life and just wishing them away or putting on some sort of facade to make, hey, we're shiny, happy people here at this church. That ain't real. And what I love about the Scriptures is the reality that it deals with. And what I love about Hebrews is he doesn't try to explain why they were facing all of this trouble. What the Hebrew writer does is he points them to the hope. But he says, yes, there is damage that sin has done in the world. There is hardship, there's hardship and there's heartache. And it's not possible, try as we might, to explain every instance of suffering as, well, that's because of that sin or that's because of that sin. That's the problem that people got in in John chapter 9 when they tried to figure out, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you remember this scenario, this question in John chapter 9? And Jesus went, y'all got no clue. Now, he didn't actually say that, but he said that. It's not possible for us to point to every single instance of suffering and say it's because of that or it's because of that, it's because of that. And honestly, folks, if we could do that, it wouldn't help us anyway. Because sin is so overwhelming. It's obvious the damage that sin has done to the world. It's obvious the ultimate cause of all suffering is because of sin. And it's obvious the effect that it had on our Lord in John chapter 11 as He goes to Lazarus. Now, John chapter 11, doing a lot of John thinking recently. John chapter 11 is an interesting scenario because Jesus knows Lazarus is sick. And he waits. He waits. He waits for four days before he leaves, after he hears that Lazarus is sick. And Lazarus is special to Jesus. It's not just, hey, how you doing? See you Wednesday night, kind of a relationship, which we shouldn't have anyway. And every time in John chapter 11, how many times, I, don't, I, I, I didn't set to count the number, does it say, well, if he'd have been here, he could have done something? If he'd have been here, he could have done something. Not realizing that he's about to do something. 
John eleven thirty three. 33, Therefore when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Couldn't it have been the understanding of all of the suffering of sin and what sin has wrought in this world that caused Jesus to just have a moment to cry? And what do we do in this world? Men don't cry. Garbage. That's garbage. He's a man. And he cried because there was suffering in front of him. His brother had died. And it affected him. He didn't just try to store it down deep inside like some myth from the 1950s that men don't cry. He didn't store it down inside of him. You gotta, you gotta be strong. You gotta control yourself. No, it affected him because the damage that sin has done affects us. And to, to say that it doesn't is foolishness. He wept at the tomb because of the damage of sin. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, writing to Christians, the Apostle Paul says in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You know, if you suffer a lot as a child of God, Romans 8.18 ought to give you some pause to think, if it's this bad, how good must it, must it going to be? The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Continuing in 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, for the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But we hope for what we do not see. We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now, there are questions that I have about this passage of Scripture. Questions that I'm not comfortable preaching about. But do you hear the picture? Paul says, you're not only groaning in your suffering, all of creation has been affected by sin. Even the creation itself groans, waiting to be unleashed from this burden that sin has caused. We see this picture in the Garden of Eden of this perfect paradise, God and man together. It's almost like heaven and earth came together in the Garden of Eden. There is this perfect place, and then sin happened. And when sin happened, this perfect paradise of God, this Garden of Eden, we were separated from. And it's like even the earth was damaged. As beautiful as this place that we get to live on can be, imagine what the presence of God will be like in eternity. You see, that, that's, that's what the Spirit is saying to Paul here. If this is as beautiful as it is, and there are some aspects of this world that are just... Wow. Imagine, just imagine what it might be like. But don't misunderstand. The damage that sin has done is real. And its effects are true. And so he says that even the creation groans and labors under the burden of the suffering that's caused by sin. But the good news is there is help. Theoretically, God could have snapped His fingers and have removed all the suffering. And apparently that's what some people want God to do. And selfishly, they want it for themselves. 
or selfishly they want it for their loved ones because they don't want to see their loved ones suffer. They want pain to be gone. Everybody wants pain to be gone. And we can th be thankful, though, that God didn't deal with it in, some, in this sort of infantile, superficial way. Oh, no big deal. Like, like God is some sort of overly gracious grandparent. I'm probably going to be a grandparent like my mother. My mother, and some of you know this story, who in front of company reached across the table and slapped my mouth because I sassed her in front of company, and I deserved that hand mark on my face. It's the same one who looked at me and said, you will not discipline my grandchildren in front of me. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, I will too. But, 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 but you see, what some of us want, what some of us want is, we want a grandfather. No discipline, no consequences, no accountability. God hasn't dealt with us superficially like that. And even more, please turn with me to John chapter 3. It wasn't just that we face the consequences of our actions, which we do, but glory be to God, He got in line in front of us. In John chapter 3 and verse 10, as Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, Jesus answers Nicodemus and said, Are you the teacher of Israel and know not these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses was lifted up, as, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through him might be saved. The help that God offers is real and it's eternal, but it's not necessarily immediate. What our God did in Jesus was, we face the consequences of our sin. We are accountable for our sin. We don't, we don't need to be blaming Adam and Eve. We don't need to be blaming our parents. We don't need to be blaming culture. We sin and we are accountable for it. But God said so that you could have eternal life, I'm getting in line in front of you. God sent His one-of-a-kind Son in, in this life to face the consequences of our sin for us. This is the help He's giving us. He didn't just say, I'm taking it all away. He says, I'm taking it with you. I'm taking it for you. I'm taking it before you. What a God. Here is the grace to help. Now you see, what we do sometimes in our pain and in our suffering is we forget He got in line ahead of us. We forget He was tempted just like we are. We forget Romans chapter 5 beginning in verse 6. Romans chapter 5 beginning in verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Those who are willing to accept the Messiah on God's terms. What we end up hoping for is what God tells us to hope for. Not just the alleviation of, of pain. Not just the alleviation of, of, of things that make us feel. You know what, folks? If we didn't feel, Jesus wouldn't matter. And honestly, that's why some, 
That's why there's a quandary of pain medication. That's why there's this quandary of liquor and narcotics. Because a lot of these things are used so that we don't have to feel. Pain isn't our friend. But pain can teach us something. Now, I understand, I don't have any pain. You know, many of you are going through excruciating pain. I am not trying to diminish what Randy's going through, what Joel's going through, what anybody with any pain is going through. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way. But without feeling, physically, emotionally, spiritually, the gospel has no impact. People sit through church services all the time and hear gospel messages and leave, nice, nice job, preach, and they go and they leave and they live their lives just however they want to. Because what we do is we put a force field around our heart because we don't want to feel. We don't want to face the consequences of our own sin. We don't want people to hurt us. We don't like that feeling. And so we shoot up, pill up, drink up, or numb up so that we don't have to feel. And God says, that's not the way to live. The only way the gospel is going to affect us is if we know that we are ungodly and sinners and without Him we have no hope. The only way to live in a world that is ravaged by sin, with any sort of peace, without an overflow of anxiety, is the peace that passes understanding and knowing that I am powerless against the effects of my own sin, much less anybody else's sin. And the only reason I've got any hope at all is because of Jesus. That's why we worship Him. Because He's our only answer. If pills were the answer, wouldn't we be as a nation a lot happier right now? If marijuana was the answer, wouldn't we all be lighting up? The answer is not in any sort of chemical dependency. The answer is not in any sort of intimate, emotional, or physical relationship. The answer is only in Jesus. And God has promised those who have been baptized and those who have been saved spiritually, He he has made it possible for us to understand His grace and the help that He offers. And how transparent He was when He told His own apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you've had enough. He told His man, who was overwrought by pain and scars and whips and worries and cares and distraught and shipwrecked, he told his own boy, he said, you've had enough. Now, that's not a public relations God out there, is it? That's a completely transparent God because sometimes He tells you and me, not like He tells Paul, but sometimes He tells us, I've given you enough. My grace is sufficient for you. Let's turn over there. I don't have it on the, I don't have it on the list, but let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 because this is instructive. Chapter 12, I said 10, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 9, he tells Paul straight out, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made complete in weakness. Now, now listen to the faith of the man. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Who does that? Someone who is more than a conqueror. That's who does. This is not some tail between his legs, I can't can't help myself kind of a Christian. This is someone who has been beaten down through life, and we need to resist the temptation to blame or charge God with our problems and with being unable or unwilling to help us merely because He doesn't. Like a great parent, we don't bail our children out on every turn. We let them learn 
God let Jesus learn obedience by the things which He suffered. We're not going to learn at the hands of an over-gracious, indulgent, enabling grandparent. Children are taught discipline by their mother and their father, or they're supposed to be. Just because God doesn't say yes to us all the time in removing our pain, He always says yes to us when we repent in removing our sin. He told His Son here, I'm not going to remove your pain. I'm not going to remove this problem. And His Son said, Praise you. Praise to your holy name. If this is the way you want it, Dad, Father, God, so be it. In Psalm 139, David extols the, the, the idea of God when he said in Psalm 139, O Lord, You have searched me and known me. You've known my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. Now it's interesting that David thought God was afar off. If you'll pardon me, David got that wrong. God is not afar off. David said, you comprehend my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me. It's high and I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascended to heaven, you were there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your light and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. But the night shines as the day, the darkness and the light, and both are alike. God knows. God knows what we're going through. And with the great high priest that He has offered us in Jesus, He knows even the temptations that we have faced. Why did He do that? He did that for us. So that we can't look at Him as God and go, you don't know what I'm going through. Because God as deity is not tempted by evil. James, the Lord's brother, tells us that. He's not tempted by evil. So what did God do for us? He condescended Himself and submitted Himself to humanity and the ravages of sin and temptations. He submitted Himself in every way so that He could be the perfect go-between between us and the Father. So that not only did He know before, He knows even more now because of Jesus. And now what we get is this amazing relationship. This amazing relationship of grace. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, that's a passage that is used and used and used. And every time I think it's overused, I don't think it's used enough. And then sometimes when it's used, I think that ain't what he's talking about, Slick. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And every time I think, no, you're not using it right, I think, well, maybe, maybe I don't need to put boundaries on God that He didn't put there Himself. We can be glad for God's help because real help is available. Real help for what's really hurting us. You see, sometimes what we want is the, the pain to be taken away. Well, pain is a symptom, not a disease. Spiritual pain is... Those who are unwilling to, to accept the gospel and the solutions to the guilt that comes with us are ineligible from this. They don't... Some people want the forgiveness but without the relationship. And you, that's impossible. Just showing up to church doesn't make us better. Having somebody answer for us and say, oh yeah, they're a good church member. That doesn't make us have a real relationship with Christ. This relationship in God, in the Spirit, through Jesus is... God's answer to the real problem. The redemption of Christ 
If we remain outside, if we remain aloof, if we refuse to be baptized, if we refuse to repent, if we refuse to confess, if we expect to have had our parents answer for us in the past, those aren't the way into this relationship at all. Christ has lived in this world and He can sympathize with our plight. He understands what we have been through. And the Hebrew writer in verse 16 says, there is grace to help, undeserved Undeserved favor is there for us. And the source of it is Jesus. And we have a decision to make. We have a decision to make if we're going to really follow this one or not. The decision to accept the help from God and make this hope, this hope and peace, and love and forgiveness that He offers us in His presence because of Jesus. We have... This isn't a decision to be made lightly. But it's a decision that needs to be made. Sometimes, sometimes young people who are church going, they don't know exactly when it is that they need to get baptized. Well, it's not at their, at their mother and father's discretion. Normally. It's when they have decided to follow Jesus. It should be made. Delaying the, delaying the decision makes it easier to put off the longer and longer and longer we go. Some of you remember Maud and Logan Creech. Maud and Logan used to sit about where Chris is sitting. And there were times that Logan, he would literally white-knuckle the pew in front of him during the invitation song. He would literally white-knuckle and hold on as if, as if the pew in front of him were holding him back. We've all been through our white-knuckle moments. We've all been through our moments, well, well not today. I, I don't know enough. And we, when we come up with all sorts of excuses why delaying the reaction, delaying the giving of ourselves to God is a more convenient time. And yet, in the genius of our God, we have stories about folks who said, in a more convenient time, I'll do this. And yet, we never hear about a more convenient time. We're left with that story, I think, as a reminder. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul says, we then as workers together with Him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For as He says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If there are any who are waiting for a convenient time to give themselves to Jesus, there's no more convenient time than now. And if you would, come while we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood No.